<laughs> All right, so welcome to what up once again. As as I said, um, it's Colossians three sixteen. Paul says, "Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs." So our, our assignment um, here, our job here, is to make the word of God available, like super available, so that every one of us can get high on the word and. Really, um, you might have heard about the sponge effect, the, you know, sponge, sponge effect of the word. You might have heard about it. And that's the fact that, you know, when you sponge up some stuff, maybe soap, maybe water, when you squeeze that sponge, okay, what the sponge soaks up, stores up is what gets to come out. So it will do us a whole lot of good if we give primary, you know, attention to sponging up the word of God, sponging up the word of God, sponging up the word of God. Jesus said that in this world, you will have tribulations. There'll be challenges, there'll be trials. You know, there'll be things that will happen to us. Um, some, yes, we might have caused them to happen. Some others, they just get to happen. You know, but whatever the situation is, when you and I give attention to the word, when we sponge it up, all right, sponge it up. I, and I understand because I mean, We've all been guilty of that. I have, and I would assume you have, where we allow ourselves get distracted, sidetracked, and we don't give the word, you know, the attention it demands, it, you know, requires. And then things things happen to us. And, you know, thank God for the mercy and the grace of God. We're able to deal with certain things, overcome certain things, not because we word it up, all right? But, I mean, he loves us. So he always consistently builds us out. Psalm, Psalm 23 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because, hey, you are always with me. So he's always with us, all right? His goodness and mercy, they follow us all the days of our life. So if everything was based on our prayer and uh, knowledge of God's word, I think we would all be sunk by now. And we know that, okay? We just might need to remind ourselves of that so that we do not think it's by our works of righteousness, by our word and all of that. However, um, so while it is important that you and I, you know, know the place of his grace and his mercy, all right, in our victorious living right here on the earth, um, it's it's important that you and I understand also the response that he gave to us to, to word up, all right, to get on his word again and again, you know, to just spend ample time, you know, um, filling up on the word. Um, I'll give a couple of examples that I appreciate a whole lot. So in Jeremiah, well, Joshua first, well, Jeremiah anyway, you know, Jeremiah in chapter one of Jeremiah, God, you know, in speaking to Jeremiah, I called him and said, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you, I called you, don't be afraid of their faces and all of that. And then God said to Jeremiah, hey, what do you see? And Jeremiah said, oh, I see the branch of an almond tree. And God said to him, you have seen correctly because I would watch over my word to perform it as a 12th verse now. So I've kind of like, you know, summarized, you know, from the beginning, like four or five, you know, skipped a few and then we got there. You know, so God said to him, what do you see? And he said, I see the branch of an almond tree. God said, you've seen correctly. I watch over my word to perform it. I will hasten my word to perform it. So you find out that God, God's eyes are over his word. All right. In Joshua chapter one, uh, you know, we see where David, uh, Moses is dead. All right. Joshua, the son of Nun, is taken over from Moses. And then God said, don't be afraid. As I was with Moses, so would I be with you. Just don't be afraid, all right? Just fear not. But then God said to him, this book of the Lord will not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. And then you will make your way prosperous. You will have good success. So God was basically telling Joshua, hey, word up, all right? Word up. This book of the law will not depart out of your mouth. You will meditate in it day and night. That That's, you know, Meditation takes quite some time, all right? It requires quite some focus, quite some energy. So God said, hey, don't, don't, don't be carried away with whatever you might be facing. Don't be carried away with whatever you might be going through. Just word yourself up, you know, get high on the word, you know. So you, you see word of, all right, being communicated, you know, in, in Joshua 1. We find it also in um, Psalms. So Psalm 1 from verse 1 to 3, blesses a man that do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He would not stand in the way of sinners. He would not sit in a seat of the scornful, but his delight will be in the law of the Lord. And in that law, he will meditate day 
and night. He will make it there day and night. He shall be like a tree. So same, you know, instruction, same, you know, admonishment or, you know, we find in Joshua chapter one saying that you should meditate on the word day and night. We find the same here. So you say, hey, I've, I've got to give attention to the word. So I've got to word up. I've got to get myself high, you know, like, like super very high on the word. So basically, you know, by way of maybe introduction, recap, reminder, I had to mention that because God expects you and I to get high on the word. He expects us to, all right, Jesus talked about the parable of the soul. And basically all he was talking about there, you know, was the fact that there are different responses to the word and it's the heart that gives the word the utmost response that will get the best of results, all right? So the wayside and then the stony ground and then among thorns and the good ground, which still yielded in varied, you know, levels of results. So you and I have got to understand, all right, that practical place. So praise God. So let's join our faith together. Father, thank you. Thank you for, for all that, you know, you've committed into our hearts, all that you have in store for us that we're finding out over and over and over more and more and more of it. Thank you for the revelation of your spirit. Thank you because you strengthen us, you embolden us. Thank you because we're taught, we're trained, we're led by your spirit and that victorious life that you've planned for us, we do enjoy in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So this particular edition of Word Up, if you remember last um, two weeks, last edition, we talked about, you know, man, spirit, soul, body. Okay. So this particular edition is dedicated to the soul, particularly to the mind. All right. I would say a few things and then we'll move on. Um, To the soul, particularly to the mind. The soul is um, said to have three compartments. And I mentioned that last episode, you could get the videos on YouTube, but we also had sent the links to you. So kindly check your emails. But if it's your first time here, you could um, just follow. If you do not mind, follow me on YouTube, but subscribe. It's it's the word, is a word for YouTube, right? Larry Rex on Osoya. And then you'll find Word Up, all right? The last one, the two sessions, all right, of it. It's right there. So we said the that from 1st Thessalonians 5, 23, Man is spirit, soul, body, and that's the biblical order. Spirit, soul, body. Man is spirit, soul, body. Three parts of man. Man has three parts. You remember that? All right. So in the three parts of man, we see that then the soul has the mind, the will, and the emotions. But then I said we could expand it. All right. You could put memory, imagination. People have expounded it. All right. But the basic, the you know, main three that usually talked about the mind the will and the emotions in case you want to start penning a few things down you know here we go so so man is spiritual body then the soul all right that soul dimension of man has mind will and the emotions did you get that so your mind right now is that seat of reasoning and then your will is your seat of decisions all right and then your emotions will be your seat of feelings and interaction so you you reason with your mind you your will is where you make decisions and the emotions the seat of your feelings you feel all those are part of it and one important thing you must understand there is nothing wrong with emotions all right you're going to learn that right? we had to learn growing up you know sometimes you feel something's wrong with emotions boys don't cry men don't cry you firm up you do that 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 but then you come to realize that hey god has emotions because God has a soul. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're told not to grieve the Holy Spirit. You cannot grieve someone who cannot feel, who cannot express feelings. So God does have feelings, all right? Bible talks about the wrath of God. So it means that God can express wrath. And don't forget from Genesis chapter 1, God made man in God's own image, all right? God made man after God's own likeness you get that god made man in god's own image after god's own likeness so if we see man having spirit soul body you'd kind of like get that picture you know from god because god made us like himself now god doesn't have a physical human body but there is bible talks about celestial bodies that there are celestial heavenly bodies in first corinthians chapter 15 so that gives us an idea that there god god is not um you know, like some say the universe, you know, mind, you know, that thing out there. No, God, God is God. And, and good to know angels can pick up forms. It means that they, they would have an angelic form. All right. So yeah, the Holy Ghost is spirit. You know, that's 
who he is as what he is and then you and i just understand okay but at least primarily god is spirit all right and god being spirit has emotions he he can feel god, god said in jeremiah 29 11 i know the thoughts i think towards you i know the thoughts that means god has a mind god can reason in isaiah chapter one all right um isaiah um you know jeremiah 29 11 that was in isaiah you know, 55, God said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. In Isaiah chapter one, God said that, come, let us reason together. Though your sin be as scarlet, they'll be as white as wood, though they'll be red as crimson, they will be, you know, as snow. God is saying, let us reason. Let us think. Let us, you know, prove me now. Bring forth strong reasons. Let's talk about the thing. So God has a mind. God can think. God can feel. He has emotions. God can be angry. God can be grieved. All right. You know, God said he repented me that I created man. I'm going to wipe everybody out with the flood, all right? We've seen God change his mind, all right? Moses talked to God, and then he changed his mind about destroying Israel. And Abraham talked to God, and he was going to change God's mind, you know, about Sodom and Gomorrah. So God has a mind, all right? Um, so let me pause in case someone needs a breather. And I hope this is not coming out, like, too fast and too, like, awkward for you. But these, these are scriptures, all right? Because somehow we just see God as that being up there is all spirit. He is all spirit. And him being all spirit has revealed to us in his word that spirit has what is called a soul. All right. The soul is, you could want to call it that interactive interface side of it. And we, we say that way, you know, I think more for our own sakes to really understand these different compartments and how they function. But if mind is where you get to make decisions, then God has a mind and God thinks thoughts. He has a thought about you. He has a plan. He has an agenda. God could give you strategy. So God does think, right? Thinking, you know, thinking is not anti-spirituality. Is if your thoughts go against the thoughts of God, then it becomes wrong. If your thoughts right, go against the counsel and, your, you know, the agenda of God, then it becomes wrong. Bible says the heart of man is wicked and you know desperately evil, you know, you know. So it's it's not because God made the heart that way, is when men now go outside the agenda of God and then they begin to plot evil, think evil, imagine evil, you know. So something just fundamentally, you know, just goes wrong there. If if you understand what um I'm saying. So we have to understand is that God is our father and God created us like himself. So when we get born again, the most important part of us is in our spirits. We've had people maybe growing up, you know, some, you know, the way to know a very spiritually minded sister, you know, is that sister whose hair is always due because she doesn't have time and she goes about praying in the spirit all the time and she doesn't have time to cook or clean up or, you know, do anything. She's just out there, you know, at the praying grounds, just praying. And then she's praying in morning, noon, and I go like, oh, dear Lord, she is spiritual. Another way you know those spiritual brothers, you know, when we get to have a lot of extra sessions and then, you know, because all we wanted to do was just pray in the spirit, you know, but you find that God deals with all the dimensions of man. Jesus in, and I said that last edition, Jesus gave his spirit, soul, and body to save our spirit, soul, and our bodies, all right? Jesus gave his to save yours, all right? His body was broken. If if that wasn't necessary at all, it won't be needed. And I'm endeavoring not to get too, you know, like trying to connect too much into last teaching. There's so much that will be useful from the last teaching that will be useful in this teaching. But because we have it on record, it, just please, please get back to it. Even if you were in the class um, or in the sessions, you know, please get back, you know, to the sessions and, and just watch them. Let them bless you. All right. So you, you find out that his body was broken. So body is involved. His soul was grieved. His soul was sorrowful. In the Garden of Eden, his soul was so, you know, his soul, he said, my soul is sorrowful unto death. All right. He, he, he prayed until drops of blood came down. You find him move with compassion again and again. All right. Bible says love. Love, yes, is spirit. But then he finds expression through the soul. You, 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 you know. I love you. I love you. You know, someone telling you I love you and you just, I love you. I, I love you. I love you. I love you. you. You want it expressed, all right? Someone is happy. You want a person to sing. So joy is within, but then it finds expression. So you find that the love that Jesus has for us was expressed. 
All right, his soul was involved in what he did. And at the end of it, I said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Okay, so it was his spirit, of course, together with the soul that went to the, you know, great beyond and did the rest of the work and then came out again, get, you know, got back into his body and then, you know, ascended. You understand that? So the body, the soul and spirit of Jesus, if you want to use the you know, ideal order, the spirit, the soul and the body of Jesus Christ were involved in saving your own spirit, your own soul, and your own body. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that we read last edition, also says that you have been bought with a price. You are not your own. Therefore, glorify God with your body and your spirit, which belong to him. So, you know, because you could say, well, it's my spirit that is born again. I could do anything I want to do with my body. I could. No, you can't. You really, like, can't, all right? You, you can't, all right? Your body belongs to him. And that body is going to be raised up on the last day. Either we get changed when a trumpet sounds or our bodies are in the ground and then it just comes back together. Matter is never destroyed. No matter what happened to the body, it was um, cremated, you know, when they burn it in ashes and blow it away somewhere into the sea, water, air, anywhere. Matter is never destroyed. And we, we see a precedent of resurrection in different areas of the Bible, but one of it is in the vision Ezekiel saw, all right, in the valley of dry bones, all right, everything, bones came back together, bones came back, because Bible says when the trumpet is sound, when trumpet sounds, all right, the dead in Christ will rise first, where are they rising from, from their graves, we saw a bit of that last week, how that when Jesus resurrected from the dead, some saints, all right, saints also resurrected with him, they came out of their graves, and moved around in Jerusalem, saying hi, all right, to different folks, so we've seen, we've seen prototypes of the resurrection we've seen the right precedents just god giving us an idea of what this thing would look like all right we've seen we've seen it we've seen it. it's 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 in the bible the body is involved all right so someone says oh what if my body is mangled my body is maimed my body is destroyed by fire when it is resurrected using the language in first corinthians chapter 15 paul said mortality will be swallowed up by life did you get that mortality will be swallowed up by life. So that body of yours or that body of anyone you know that was mangled, maimed, you know, cut off due to what diabetes or some accidents or something, everything will be restored, refreshed, far better than it was. So you, you can't have a sickle-celled body and then you resurrect with a sickle-celled body. No, mortality will be swallowed up by life. The word life there is a Greek word zoe that you know. So mortality will be swallowed up. That's when you and I would even enter the fullness of Romans 8, 11, where, you know, we would see, you know, the spirit of God giving life to our mortal bodies. And that's why some um, Bible scholars love to argue and say that that verse is not for now. It's for resurrection. Hey, it is for now because the spirit of God lives in you now. But the fullness of it, the fullness of it, when you get that glorified body, that's when the fullness of it is unleashed and unlocked into you. I, I hope I'm not talking too fast, all right? You know, but then the fullness of it, the total, you know, um, fullness of it is when you and I just, boom, just blow up. So your body is relevant, all right? Your body is. And then we know about the spirit. We talk in tongues. We fellowship with God. We do all of that. The part we seem to be careless with is the mind. And that gave birth to this one. For the next episode, I would love us to talk a lot more about the spirit, the qualities, the characteristics. And you might want to note that down. And I want to also just quickly say, um, word up so far and for now, each of the sessions require, you know, registrations for you to come in. Um, I, my assignment as, as an apostle and a teacher in the body of Christ Right, it's to complement what churches are doing. Um, so I am um, when we want to run like a school, that will be properly announced. People will be told. Um, so they say come in, come in, you know, whenever you want to. So nothing is binding, no fellow. If I sign up now, um, they will expect me to always to be in a class. No, 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 it's all right. Um, even when you get to miss the class, you might freely um, request for the recordings if 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 that works fine with you. Now, being in it live, I believe it has what it would do. And if you miss the class, you may end up procrastinating. So, hey, all right, if you can't, or if you can't find, and then the good part is, you know, it will be on YouTube in a couple of days right after, you know, right after we're done, all right? So, glory to God. So, note again, the spirit, all right? The spirit, soul, body, and then in the soul, you have the mind, the will, and the emotions. Did you get that? So, we have spirit, soul, body. In the soul, you have the mind, you have the will, and then you have the what now? 
emotions and your mind, your seats of reasoning. You reason with that compartment, okay? And then your will, you make decisions. I will, I will go tomorrow. I will go now. I will make that move. I will is the seat of decision-making. And then your emotions, the seat of your feelings. Did you get that? The mind is a seat of reasoning. And then the will is the seat of decision-making, the center, if you prefer that word, the center of decision-making or the arena of decision-making. And then the emotions, the arena of feelings. Emotions are not evil. Emotions are not evil. But let me put it this way, the way we are taught a number of years ago. Your emotions are a very, very good slave or a very, very bad master. Did you get that? The emotions are a very good slave or they are very good slaves since I'm putting R already. All right, the emotion is a very good slave, but it is a very terrible master. If you're led by your emotions, emotions are fickle. They are not wrong. They are not evil. They are fickle. They need to be trained. They need to be, you know, but they, they exist. And like I said some minutes ago, God has feelings. God has emotions. God expresses emotions. The Bible says he would joy over us with singing. He expresses us to rejoice. Those, those are emotions. You say, no, it's of the spirit. Yes, it is of the spirit. But then... Um, your body and your soul get involved in it. How do you say there is joy? And then go, praise God, glory to God. Say, are you joyful? Yes, I am. Come on, anybody joyful in us today? Yes, we are. And you know, like, man, <laughs> you know, that emoticon, the, the man emoticon or emoji. <laughs> All right. So mind, will, and emotions anyway. So, so your emotions, they, they are tangible, they are real. You, you need to feel things, even in a place of worship. Some say, oh, you, sometimes people get too emotional. Now, some might you know, get theatrical about it, but emotions are, are right, all right? You, you shed tears in the place of worship. You, you shout when you get a revelation from God. You say, but all those are spiritual. No, you're, you're missing it again. The soul and the spirit are together. As spiritual as they are, they find expression in the soul and then it triggers reactions in the body. You jump, you scream, you shout, you run around, glory to God. If your spirit alone is doing all the rejoicing, your body will be sitting on the chair. We won't see anything happening, all right? You won't, you won't have that great big old smile on your face, you know, when, you know, the worship leader picks up that next worship song that you just so love, you know, that smile that, oh, this song again. Come on, you say, well, that was my spirit. That was your soul. <laughs> that was your soul. That was your soul. And that part of your soul, your emotions, they're lovely. The emotions are real. But they make a very horrible, horrible master. You don't put the emotions in front of you. You don't say emotion lead because, you know, today you feel good, tomorrow you feel bad. Have you ever woken up and you felt, I just feel so terrible. I feel like a sinner. I just feel like everything is just horrible. God even doesn't love me. If you let those feelings rule you, then you will not amount to much spiritually. 2 Corinthians 5 and the 20, you know, now nah, come on. My mind's going to righteousness, all right? But anyway, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. All right, sight, there will be sensory perceptions. So you, you, you don't deny emotions. You, you don't. The same way when we teach faith, we say faith doesn't deny the facts. Faith doesn't deny what's going on around you. All right, but faith superimposes the word of God over anything because it knows it can change it. Same way you don't say, well, I, I, I don't have emotions. Now, you become less sentimental. All right, the more you yield to the things of the spirit, sentimental, right? Because you're allowing yourself to be a lot more governed, all right, by the word and the leadings of the spirit. But doesn't mean you do not have emotions. You don't actually become less emotional. So when we get to say you become less emotional, it's those other parts of you that are up and down and up and down. And, you know, like Ephesians 4 says, you're not tossed to and fro. All right, children are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So you're not tossed to and fro by stuff happening in you or to you, rather. You know, but you're a lot more steady. You're you're set. You're you're firm because you're not allowing your emotions lead you, but your emotions can be led. Did you get that? See, lady finds that she's in the wrong relationship. These three parts come into play. So she reasons. All right, do I have a future with this person, or maybe? Um, someone feels, oh, I need to quit my job. It doesn't pay me, all right? It, it's not allowing me to do X, Y, Z. I want to quit the job, all right? So you reason. So your mind comes in there. You're reasoning. Um, if I quit the relationship, you know, if I stay in a relationship, if I quit the job, if I stay in a job, 
if I relocate, if I stay, whatever it is, you reason through and then your will comes in. Clip, this is what I'm going to do. I am breaking up with him. I would send him an SMS. I will meet with him tomorrow. I will break up. I will send my manager or HR or anybody. I will send them an email stating I'm no longer working there. I am moving to the next town. Whatever it is, you make up your mind, all right? So, and then you, the wheel comes into place. So when I say make up your mind, you're telling person, you know, reason and clip it. Use your will. Are you getting this breakdown? The mind and the will. You use your will. You know, you clip. You say, no. Nope. And that's what I'm going to do. But then there's this other part. So Liddy eventually sends the SMS and the boy says, I want to see you. And then he comes with that puppy face, you know, and then he stares up something within her like, oh, oh, you know, and she feels, am I really going to break up with him? But then mine goes, we, we agree. We fall through it. We'll, we'll say, yeah, we, we conclude that we're going to do emotions. Goes, can we give him a second chance? Can we, you know, can we just allow him? Can we, can we, you know, and then you send the email to HR and HR sits you down and begins to tell you how great you've been, how there's a promotion coming up in six months. And then you go, ah, and then it's also trying to hit out your reasoning. Come on, think through it. And then HR says, I'm going to miss you. You know, was, you know, there's this new you know project we have and I thought you'd be on my team. And then you go, oh, and I really like HR. You know, and then, do you see that? So the mind thinks through it and then the wheel clips it. Like, we're going to do it. I will get this thing done. I'm going to make this happen. The will and then the emotions go, come on, maybe not today. Hey, let's enjoy these people a little bit. Let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss them. Let's, and you find out that your emotions are strong enough. And I think you would agree with me. Your emotions are strong enough to override what your mind thought through and what your will, you know, clipped. Your emotions are strong enough to override. So when you allow emotions to be the master, there could be a whole lot of trouble. Because today you say good, tomorrow you say not good. Today you say fine, tomorrow you say not fine. Today you're high, tomorrow you're just down. Because how are you feeling today? Man, <laughs> yeah, you're going to go out. Man, <laughs> and yes, you know, just you're not, you're not in the mood. And then tomorrow you're all sparky, you know, fired up. And I, I believe this is clear you know, like, like super so clear. And, and this edition is so like pretty much great. Yes, I have a guest and she'll be joining tomorrow. She's preaching for our uncle today. I would have loved us to do Friday, Saturday together, I mean, Saturday together, Sunday together, but this works. We'll run through. We have a number of Bible, a, a whole lot of Bible verses to read. So we're going to run through Bible verses together. And then I'll start up like 15 minutes into tomorrow and then she jumps right in and takes us on. She is experienced. I mean, let me just say a bit about her. I'll say it again when we're ending. Um, I mean, she grew up in, in the house of preachers. Her, her maternal grandma, her, her paternal grandma, solid, solid preachers. All right. Her, her maternal grandma is Dr. Billy Brim. Some of you might know that name. You might have heard of the name. That's her maternal uh, grandma. Her paternal grandma, Betty Oaks. Um, she, she's gone up to build up many years ago, very, very dear friends with Gloria Copeland. And of course, Dr. Billy Brim is like Gloria Copeland's best friend till now. So she's from that kind of family, that heritage. That's, you know, so she's Betty Oak's grand, uh, granddaughter and then Gloria Copeland, Billy Brim's granddaughter. Um, she sat in, you know, Kenneth Higgins' room Bible Training Center under Kenneth Higgins himself. All right. So that's a whole lot of plus, you know, that was... um. That was the only perk that I could have taken some of us physically to that realm in Tulsa, where you know. So, but I mean, it's it's great. I still easily recommend Roman to people anyway, um, because that's that's Hagen is still the greatest influence of my life. Um, so, but I love now. Why why is she coming? So ha having you know come up in that kind of home background, she gets into college and then her mind flips. All right, she gets exposed to. Something that happened to her when she was a kid, and let me wait if she'll say that tomorrow. She might, she gets to, so not a problem with her. You know, she got high on sex as a not boyfriend, like just she just went off drugs, ended up in an asylum. I mean, someone who's a grandkid of those kinds of people ends up in an asylum. Now, there's a prayer dimension to the story. What we're dealing with is the mind dimension, the door that was opened and how it was closed, and the things the Lord had taught her all through that process. 
my mom had been praying. I, I mean, people, you can't come from that kind of family and go nuts. And, and many people are not praying for you. So there's a prayer dimension. There would have been prophecies. Also, there's a prayer dimension, the revelation dimension to the story. You know, she has a book out. And then she said, this is the version she might still write, which is, you know, the parents, you know, version of the story. The other side of the story, what they saw, what God told them and everything about it. How she bounced back, I mean, she's been in ministry, started the church, handed the church over, pastors, you know, her grandma's church with her uncle. How was the door opened? How did the door get closed? Because, you know, many times they get shocked. We say, oh, this, this spiritual brother, what happened to him? That spiritual sister, what happened to her? The truth, which I could also tell you by experience is you open somewhere in your mind. It's not your spirit. It's not your spirit. It's, it's not your spirit. You know, I remember someone, you know, telling me a number of years ago how that he was, you know, he just decided I'm going to go off. All right. One of, one of my mentors back then. Say, I'm going to just go. I'm just going to go off. And then was smoking. Say, I'm going to, I'm going to smoke. So he got smoking. And while he was smoking, the Holy Ghost gave him a word of knowledge for someone, a word of knowledge for someone. He was like, can't you even give up? I'm smoking right now. I'm smoking. So they just gave him a word of knowledge for one person, a word of knowledge for another person. And, you know, you'd almost wonder, could that happen? Yes, because your spirit is in perfect, you know, condition. The issue usually is in the mind. And like we said, the last edition, it's where your mind flips to. That's where victory is experienced. If your mind flips, you know, to more of the spirit, God's word and all of that, there's victory there. If your mind flips somewhere else, you know, now I'm going to pause a bit. There's this video. I, I just love how um, it was illustrated. And Dromak has a solid teaching on spirit, soul, and body. And then someone did, you know, an illustration, you know, uh, and sent it to Andrew. And uh, Andrew loved it. And it's just beautiful. It's on YouTube. All right. So if you love the video and you, you know, you might want to watch it again on your own, which I feel you should, you could just, um, it's YouTube, just Andrew Romak, spirit, soul, body animation illustration you know whatever word and then it comes up so i'm, I'm gonna play it it's about 18 minutes you might want to write draw do whatever but stick your head up in this i know when we do zoom meetings like this we could like be doing like 10 things at the same time i know that but please as best as you can um give this attention all right i know you could tell us if i watch it later which we usually don't so please give this attention please if you can utmost um, attention. So allow me. Um, um, okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I just saw a comment. I'd asked if I was talking too fast. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to play this. If the sound isn't too clear, well, it should be perfect. So I'll just play it and then um, you could drop a comment if there's anything I need to know. All right. Thank you. So here we go sharing that screen. All right. So are you ready, somebody? So I'll, I'll take my video off soon. And then, um, okay, yep. Uh -huh. Okay, so yes, I'd, I'd I'd wondered about that. Um, let me let me increase volume. Volume is at the highest. Okay, so uh, uh, stop share. Okay, so. So what what I what I would do is this I would um you know what I'll do is this the link would nah okay so 
unofficially we could make the link available. Uh, I don't know if I'll be breaking any copyright law. Uh, yeah, so I I'll just keep teaching. So I'm noticing from what everybody's writing here that the volume is a, yeah, audio, audio too low. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll do the teaching. You would, you would love it. It would help you. So what I could do is um, you get the link. Maybe towards the end of the today's session, right? You would get the link and then it will be right there. You would watch it. It's 18 minutes. It would help you. So let's, let's, let's just move on from there. I'd actually done a test run and I felt it was low. I felt, okay, you're hearing it. I was using my own phone to try to play. I'm like, I'm not hearing it too well. It seems low. YouTube volume is on the highest. Um, Let's see. All right, let me, okay, I just increased an, another volume here. Let's let's check it one more time, see how that goes. All right, um, one more, one more shot. One more shot. If it's good enough, please let me know. Thank you. Now that is so obvious. We are made up of a spirit, soul, and body. And the body is very obvious. You go look in a mirror, that's the part that you see. And he would be speaking to my soul, which is my mental, emotional part. Some people define soul as your mind, will, and emotions. And I think that that's certainly is true. I don't think that it's all inclusive. There's more to it. I believe that you're conscious. Right. Of part of your okay. Soul. Your soul is in you. Okay. Still no audio. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. Hmm. Um, start. Um, okay, select share sound in the. Okay, Sony is trying to tell me what to do. Hold on, can I can I just read off you guys? Let me see. All right, select um, share sound in the bottom left corner of the share select window. Let's see that. Nah. Okay. Hmm. Let me see that again. All right, select program desktop, which you wish to share. Select share sound in the bottom left corner of the share. Hmm. <laughs> All right. But it's better. Okay, so only saying it's better. Uh, click on the share in the bottom right corner of the Okay, no, let me let me teach on a bit. I'll try. I think because I'm like, I'm taking some people's time, but this is good stuff. I think it should help. I'm so, so click like a button somewhere and um, share sound and then that, that'll work. But let's, let's teach on a bit. I can't forget because I want you to watch the video. You'd, you'd love it. You'll love it. All right. So understanding these three parts, because we find out that what we all love to do is praying tongues and then fast. And then you wonder how come the person spending the time fasting isn't, um, is making, you know, mistakes and maybe not growing spiritually. Why should I spend three hours in prayer and then I come out depressed? It's because there's a lot going on in my emotions, that part of my soul. And so we could simply say, there's a lot going on in your soul. Now, totality or by summary, the word we would use a lot more today is the mind but allow it to also represent that general part of your soul. Because when you take in the word into your mind, it influences your will, it influences your soul. I mean, it influences your emotions, all right? Did, did you get that? When you take the word into your mind, when you allow your mind to be exposed to God's word, something begins to happen to you. What's that? It changes you. It changes your reasoning which changes your decision-making and it changes your reaction to things. Did you get that? It changes your reasoning in Acts. And I love that example always. In Acts chapter 28, Paul was shipwrecked at the end of 27. He ended up as an, on an island called Malta with the rest of the prisoners. And then he was picking sticks to be burned to create more fire for them to warm up. And then a viper, a venomous snake bites Paul and he shakes it off into the fire. No, I mean, that 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 for me is like um like whoa because you're like wondering he didn't scream and then you know plead the blood of jesus he didn't shout and then talk in tongues for a while he didn't run around and then go somebody pray with me his reaction was as though there were no reaction 
How did he get there? It's because he would have had to renew his mind so much. It was Paul who told about a lot about you know the life of God, you know, law of spirit life has set me free from love, sin, and death. It was Paul who wrote to us, you know, telling us in the word Romans 8 11, you have you know life for told us Colossians Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Paul has a lot to say, all right. Taught us how that the Holy Ghost lives in us and all of that. So he would have, I believe, grown in his revelation, grown in his understanding to a point where his reasoning was affected. All right. His decision making was affected. His emotional reaction, snake, it was affected. Affected by what? Because it's not snake we really are afraid of. What we're afraid of is death. So Paul had, over time, I believe, defined his relationship where death was concerned. And that's the fact that I'm not afraid of death. I mean, Paul's one who said, I'm not even afraid to go to Jerusalem. They'll kill me, they'll kill me. Come, I'm ready to go. But some years earlier than that, when he just began his ministry, he heard he was going to die. And then he had to be, you know, <laughs> let down through a basket, through a window, in a basket, through a window. Something happened to the man. And this lets us know, guys, you can retrain. And that's the renewal of mind. You can retrain your emotions. You can retrain your will. You can retrain your mind, basically your entire soul, by that consistent imputing of the word of God into you, that consistent putting in of God's word. You just jam the word of God into you and then, boom, you're just all right. Do you understand this? All right. Just jam the word of God again and again into you. Certain things are important. I'm going to read a number of Bible verses now that talk about the mind, all right? So if you're ready, you have your Bibles with you, all right? A number of Bible verses that have to do with the mind. First, I want to talk about the sameness of mind because why, why is it possible that there could be division amongst Christians? First Corinthians and then chapter three, Paul said, I couldn't speak to you as unto spiritual but as unto canal, even as unto babes in Christ. You wonder, what does it mean? Because they're behaving like babies, but they're spiritual. And one of the points Paul raised is that there was no unity, right? There was no unity amongst them, no shared um, vision. There was division, 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 separate vision, different directions that we're going his or her way. So sameness of mind. And if, and I believe everybody here should be a worker in a local assembly. You should be a Christian working in a group with other Christians and at work, a group with other people. The only thing that will move things forward is when we have sameness of mind. Now, should you have sameness of mind for political reasons? And that's not the point I'm making here, but primarily for kingdom's sake, this is. So Paul in Romans 12, verse 16, Romans 12, I'm just going to read a whole lot of mind-related verses, all right? So pick them in their brackets. So this bracket is sameness of mind. Paul says in Romans 12, 16, all right, be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own eyes, all right? Romans 12, 16, be of same mind one to another. Mind not, don't put your mind on high things. Don't be high-minded. I could pray in the spirit. And I'm high-minded, I'm looking down on other people. So it says, be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. You wonder, what's the connection here? Yes, because you could be so spiritual and then your mind is needing this teaching, this training. Put your mind here, all right? Is that where you put my mind? Yeah, you wouldn't know if you don't see it in the word. Second Corinthians 13 and 11, 2 Corinthians 13, 11, Paul says, finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you, live in peace, be of one mind, when you're in a place, and then one believer likes to bicker, you know, about another believer, slander, gossip, and that does happen in the church, does happen in the units, why, why, why is it, you know, that the leader always wants us to go this way. Why does the unit leader wants us to do this? Uh, and then the person wants to take you of another mind. He says, no, be of one mind. If you have an issue with a leader in the setting where you are, talk to the leader. Talk to the leader, all right? Now, Philippians chapter 1, 27. Philippians 1, 27. Only let your conversation be as it becomes of the gospel of Christ. Whether I come and see you or else I'm absent, 
I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together. Union, guys. Union, all right? Philippians 2.2, 2, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being in one accord. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Put the other guy up. Celebrate the other person. Don't feel bad. Oh, she's being celebrated too much. Celebrate her too. He's being celebrated too much. Celebrate him too. You'll be celebrated. God watches all of us and he cares about all of us. You'll be fine. All right? Be of one mind. And this is interesting. Why? When I roll with other believers, why is there that great chance of division? If there is no chance of, I mean, you and I have seen division a whole lot in church, all right? So Paul says the issue is they were not on one mind. So you can be of one mind. You should be of one mind. Union, husbands and wives, friends, best friends, colleagues, endeavor to be of one mind. If it means conversing again and again, you know, discussing that topic, bringing it up again, endeavor to be of one mind. Where we don't have one mind, we give a lot of room to decision. I mean, to division. Does it mean we agree every time? I learned over the years, you can disagree and yet agree. It means we agree on being peaceable while we've not yet drawn a sameness of conclusion on that topic. So our oneness of mind at least is on peace, all right? And you find him saying here, fulfill you my joy, all right? That, and that you be like-minded, having same love, being of one accord and of one mind, an accord, an accord. So that peace, that union, so the mind agreement, we could at least have one mind on the fact that we're going to have peace. You get that? We could have one mind on the fact that we're going to have union and we'll be in one accord. While we're still trying to agree on many other things we don't agree on, we could still be of one mind. I hope, I hope that helps somebody. I want to talk about now um, one mind with people, but then there's a mind where Christ is concerned. I, I know your mind goes, yeah, first thing I said to 2 verse 16, I have the mind of Christ. I understand that, but I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Do you know that 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, for as he is, he ends by saying, for as he is, so are we in this world, all right? 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, as he is, so are we. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17 also says, for he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Did you get that? So we're just as he is, we're one spirit with him, we're same. But then you find now that Bible says, do something to your mind. If I'm just like him, if I'm same with him, why do I need to do anything to my mind? Why do I need to walk on my mind? I, I don't have to. You do have to. You understand that? You do have to. <laughs> because there's a lot your mind does to your spiritual growth and development. And I want you to watch this now. So we just saw, okay, be of one mind with other believers. But watch this. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Hold on. Why? Hmm. He begins to want to teach us about humility because Jesus, who was God, if you remember Philippians 2, did not think it's robbery to be equal with God, but he humbled himself in the form and fashion of a man. And then he was obedient to death, even the death of a cross. And then God highly exalted him and set him up above, you know, every name at the name of Jesus. Hey, everybody remembers that part. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue. We, we remember that part, right? But we see here, it begins with, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. So I could be same with him in spirit. I could be in union with him. And then I could be saying, oh, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. But an instruction is written to me. This is how he would have thought. So I want you to have sameness of mind with your fellow brothers and sisters. Now I want you to have sameness of mind with the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you get that? I want you to have sameness of mind with your fellow brothers and sisters. Now I want you to have sameness of mind. Did you get that? With the Lord Jesus he had a class, but he was willing for the sake of an assignment to humble himself and submit himself to a lower level than his class. And that brings to mind sometimes when we want to fight for our rights. You know, it is your right. It is, 
you know, you feel, oh, this person's cheating me off what is rightfully mine. But check at that point what the Holy Ghost might have you do. Maybe you let it go. You might lose that but win something later. You might lose that and win that same person later. You know, we don't know how these things pan out. So it says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. He was equal to God. He didn't think a robbery to be equal to God, but submitted himself, subjected himself to death, death on the cross. Death on the cross for the Jew is a curse, all right? Curse is any man that hangs on a tree. It wasn't just stoned, it was crucified, all right? We, we, we love that emblem right now. You see people wearing the sign of the cross and everything, but it was a shameful thing. That, that's what it was. That's what it represented. He became shamed, all right? He was put to shame for all of us. First Peter chapter four, I'm going to read verses one to five. First Peter chapter four, one to five. It says, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, watch this now, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, saying, think like Christ. Do have that mind. Equip yourself with this thinking. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves in the same mind. For he that had suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin, that he no longer should leave the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our lives may allow us to have, you know, done the will of God, you know, the, done the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, wild parties, and all of that, abominable idolatries, where in verse four, they think it's strange that you run not with them. You don't roll with them anymore. They think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, all right? Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the living? And the death? So it says, think like Christ, all right? Why? Because he suffered in the flesh. And when he did that, he ceased from sin in the same way. You also consider yourself, just Similar language, that's what Paul was saying in Romans chapter 6. Consider yourself to be dead indeed to sin. All right, consider yourself to be dead indeed to sin. So there's a sameness of mind. And Bible says you need to have that same mind. How would, you know, um, how would Jesus have handled this situation? How would Jesus have done this? What, what, would, what would he do? And we don't have to think too far. The word of God shows us, all right? He was lowly. He knew when to confront. He knew when to hold back. He knew when to speak. He knew when to love. He, he knew all that. He knew when to celebrate Peter and say, hey, you are Peter. And on this rock, you know, I'll build my church. Gates of hell will not prevail because flesh and blood did not give you this revelation that you just gave about me being the Christ, the son of the living God. And then the next moment, Peter says, hey, you shouldn't go to the cross. I forbid you, you cannot die. And he tells Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. So he knew when to rebuke. He knew when not to rebuke, all right? I mean, when the guy said, hey, we've seen the Lord and Thomas showed up and said, hey, until I see, I, I won't believe. Jesus could have just come, rebuked him, and said, now you can see me. But he indulged him to some degree. Thomas, reach out your hand, touch me. Check my hands, check my side. Hope you now believe, all right? Blessed are they who would hear and, you know, they, they don't see, but they believe. But he indulged them. So Jesus wasn't just the guy that would criticize, you don't understand it, you're, you're just a fool, you know, blah, 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 blah. The times he needed to confront, he did confront. He's our standard. That's what I'm saying here. And then we follow that standard. Okay. What happens to the mind? I'm, I, I'm told we're going to just... Read a number of verses where the mind is concerned and you see something interesting here, all right? James chapter one, from verse five, says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask from God who gives to all men liberally and operate it not. Let him ask in faith, nothing doubting, for he that you know, doubts is wavers like a sea. Verse eight of James chapter one says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Double-minded, not double-spirited. Your heart is focused on God. Your attention is on God. It now says a double-minded man, meaning his mind is that way and this way, that way and that way. Do you understand that? Double-minded. So what do I do? I 
this this bracket now i put the verses in brackets we looked at sameness of mind with fellow brothers you know and sisters and then we're now looking at you know the same thing again here where we have to do with christ and then we're looking at sameness of mind or steadying your mind or that's the bracket here how do i steady my mind how do i stabilize my mind second Thessalonians chapter two verse two Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse two, that you be not shaken in your mind. That means your mind can shake. Your mind can, oh, I'm just so afraid. Would I make it? Would I make it? Don't forget your spirit has a life on the nature of God. You're just like Christ. You're in union with Jesus Christ. But with all of that happening within you or all that has happened within you, you can shake. Your mind can shake. And then you're going, oh, I'm afraid. So he says here that you be not shaken in your mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. But I don't want you shaken. I, I don't want you shaken so your mind could shake. What do you do again when your mind is shaken? You just get on the word. The summary of all of these things, we're still going to talk about the word. You know that. This is word up. All right, but I want you to see the role the mind plays, all right? The role and the importance of the mind in spiritual growth. Because you could pray in tongues and pray in tongues and pray in tongues. Have you been there? And then you remember an ugly thing somebody did to you, and then anger rises up within you. I wondered how come I could pray in tongues and get mad. And then you feel so unholy, so ugly with yourself. How could I pray in tongues? And get mad. Because 1 Corinthians 14, 14, we'll see that much later. Bible says, when I pray in tongues, my spirit prays. So the person doing the prayer is your spirit. Did you get that? When I pray in tongues, my spirit prays. And then your understanding is unfruitful. That's why you could pray in tongues and you're going, blah, 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 shape of you. Yes, yes, sir. And then your mind travels. And then you you and then your your tongue is on automatic. I know you've been there, maybe you've been there. And if you haven't been there, I guess you're better than most of us. All right. And then your mind wanders off. Why is that able to happen? Because it's a separate faculty doing the praying. When you pray in tongues, your mind is bypassed. Your mind is not always engaged. And then you have to train your mind to get engaged. Do you understand that? So I'm saying that to let you know that you could pray and then you're still angry. You could pray and then you thought of, would this thing really happen? Starts rising up, rising up within you, rising up within you, rising up within you, and then fear comes. And you could even stop the prayer for a while and then cry a little bit. And then you realize, okay, it's only God that can really help. And then go back to the prayer. Why? Because of the fact that you're being shaken in your mind. So under you being, you know, having to steady your mind, we see that there's a possibility for a double-mindedness. We see also that here you can be shaken in your mind, shaken in your mind. Hebrews eleven fifteen, very interesting verse of the Bible. Hebrews 11, talking about the children of Israel. All right, he said, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country, all right, from when they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. If you remember Hebrews 11, talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So he builds all of this in. And then this is within that same context, talking about, you know, forefathers of faith it's building that pointing he said if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out they might have had opportunity to return allow me you know let's do a quick play on words here but very accurate mindful 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 i love it when we read you know the psalmist bible says the lord is mindful of us and you say oh his mind is full of me and it's correct all right god thinks about you all the time so here it says, if they had been mindful of where they came out from, why was Abraham able to get out of his daddy's house? Because his mind likely was full of the instruction and the command he received from God to get out. Lot and his family received a similar instruction, but his wife's mind seemed to have been full. Did you get that now? His wife's mind seemed to have been full of whatever it was that she left back at Sodom. Maybe the jury, maybe the money, maybe whatever it was, you know, obviously money, money, like we have today wasn't, you know, money, money then, but they had, you know, shekels and silver and all of that. Now, her mind so full of it, she looks back. She turns back. 
Did you get that? So if these guys had been mindful of the country from whence they came, and when your mind is full of something, it starts crafting out a way to get back to it. Classic example, you're fasting, you know it's not time to you know, end the fast yet, but suddenly you begin to think about food, 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 food. Before you know what's happening, you might never re remember how you got in front of the deep freezer or the refrigerator or you know, just you know, dipped your hand into something and began to chew. And like, hey, look, my fast, your mind was likely full of it. So there is the, you know, double mind or the double minded, you know, one. And then there is the shaken mind. Then there is the mind that is full. You know, so question is, what is your mind full of? All right. The situation of the economy, you know, um, your age right now and then, you know, how you need to be married and, you know, what's your mind full of? Right, the psalmist said, if it had not been for the Lord, it would have been you know, consumed. Again, the psalmist said, I would have fainted right, if I did not meditate or believe to see the goodness of God in the land of the living, meaning he had a choice. I would have fainted. I believe that I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. So there were two possibilities. There were two, two realities, as it were, two options. Faint, believe you see the goodness of God. That means that believing to see the goodness of God, that hope is strong enough to keep you going. Because if you do not have hope, you'll be in despair. You'll faint. You're like, things are getting worse. This whole, you know, mandating thing going all over the world, one step at a time, something's going on, something's worse. Some, and then you become afraid. All right. So the Psalm said, I would have fainted, but I believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I believe that, all right? So this is how you're going to steady your mind because there is the mind that is not, um, is not fixed, it's double-minded. Now, let, let me tell you something you could do to a double mind. Sit down and reason and conclude. What do I mean? So um, is it A, is it B? Is it A, is it B? Then you want to pray because the context is, in James chapter one here from verse five, whoever lacks wisdom, let him ask from God. God will give you know, this wisdom to all men, liberally go not or braid, ask in faith, don't doubt. So he said, but, but I don't really know what I want. Then spend time praying and talks about it. But when you say it is A, and then you're desiring a B, then it's called double-mindedness because your mind is there, your mind is there, your mind is there. Do you understand that? So you, you stay on, what exactly am I, am I trusting God for? What exactly is my faith out on? What exactly do I believe God for? So what do I do with a double mind? You stay, all right? You keep reminding yourself from God's word, this is the best. This is what I've chosen. This is it. What if you want to change it? Feel free, change it. But don't be double-minded about it. Change your mind about it. Did you get that? We see in scripture how God changed his mind. So there's nothing wrong with changing your mind, all right? So I believe in the name of Jesus, I want five of that stuff. All right, and then like five. Hmm, God, I want to give some of it. I want to be a blessing with some of it. Think how I need more than five. And then go to scripture, which might help you, help your reasoning. You know, you read about abundance, you read about the giver, you read about, okay, God, five looks like it's just for me. I'm thinking just about myself. God, is it okay? I, I believe you for like 12 of it. 12 of it, because you make all grace abound towards, you know, me so that in all things at all times, having everything I need, I abound. So, I, based on the scripture, Father, I would like to believe for 12 of it. So in the name of Jesus, I believe. So what you did was you zeroed or canceled that five and then you went for 12. So you're not like, hmm, five. Oh, and I want 12, eh? And I like five, hmm, and I like 12, eh? All right. Now, this might um, not apply so, so directly on your particular case, but the principle is such. I'm wanting you to see there's a difference between double-mindedness and a change of mind. You switch, not that anymore, Lord. It's this. Because let him ask in faith. Do you want twins or you want a boy or a girl? I don't know. Then just pray in tongues about it. Pray in tongues about it. Why? Because he that searches the heart. I love that verse. Uh, Romans chapter 8. He that searches the heart, note what the mind of the spirit is. The spirit has a mind. <laughs> he that searches the heart, know what it is. So what you're doing in that case, you could just pray out the agenda of God. And then believe you receive. I believe I receive. Thank you, Father. I believe I receive your best, your best, your best. Over time of doing that, 
what God's thought on that matter starts, um, you know, climbing up in you, just climbing up in you, you know, God's thought on that matter. Just, I believe I receive your best. I receive your best. So I said, do you want A, B? Give me some time. I, I, I don't know. All right. Because sometimes making some decisions could be difficult for us. Listen, God says, ask me, right? He did say, ask me. So you want to ask him something. Watch this. Jesus said, your heavenly father knows you have need of this thing. And people have said, oh, if God knows what I need, then why is God asking me to ask? And I understand that feeling too. Just give me stuff. Come on, just suck me out and leave me out of this thing. Just, you do it. No, the father loves you to make your request. No, he wants to hear you say it. He wants you to have the joy of laying hold, all right? Bible says he has pleasure in the prosperity of his people. Bible says in Hebrews 11, all right, that, Without faith, you can't please him. So he wants you to use your faith. He wants you to have that joy. Jesus said, ask me that your joy may be full. He knows what you need. But I want you to place a finger on, I asked for that and it came, right? And then I asked for this and it came, yeah? And then I asked for that and it came. Glory to God, my daddy loves me. He wants you to ask. So he says, ask. If, you, if your child asks for, you know, fish or, you know, bread, you know, or egg, you won't give it you know, serpent or, you know, stone or scorpion. You, you, you won't do that. You know, you, you won't do that. You give a child what your child is asking for. So God wants to hear you ask. I hope that helps somebody right here. Because you wonder, why should I ask when God knows what I need? Because he wants you to have the joy of seeing your prayers answered. Ask and your joy will be full. All right. When you receive it, he wants you to see that. Now, as much as God wants you to ask, God is not saying, hmm, impress me. I see you're so confused. I'm not impressed. He impressed me. Get yourself together, girl, and come back again and tell me what you need. All right? I'm God. I don't waste my time with people like you. When you know what you want, talk to me. <laughs> Forget about that, right? That's not what God is doing. <laughs> Listen, he could help you make the decision. Jesus said, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you. That's John 16. In John 14, he said, I'll pray to the Father to give you a helper. Because when you're there, like, God, I don't even know how to ask. The Holy Spirit says, that's why I'm here. Romans 8, for you know not what to pray for. 26 verse, right? For we know not what to pray for as we ought. So your mind is fuzzy. The Holy Ghost will help you. It's the mind, but he'll help you. And he will supply to your mind how better to handle the thing. He knows the mind of the Father. He knows your mind. He knows there are five things on your mind right now. Oh, God, I need this blue. And then I need the black. And then I need, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. I'm just confused right now. He's there to help you. For you know not what to pray for the way you want to. Pray in tongues about it. Holy Spirit, you know how I feel about this right now. My mind is everywhere. He's the Holy Ghost. If you don't say, he knows. 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 My mind is everywhere. But what some people do is they just leave that and end it there. My mind's everywhere. God knows my mind's everywhere. God just understands me. God knows. God knows. My own mind is always everywhere. My mind is just always scattered. My mind is just messed up. That's how my mind is. That's not how he made you. And that's not how he wants you to be. All right? So he says, we'll, we'll see that soon. You gird up the loins of your mind. You firm up. He will help you do that. Don't, don't see him as one person just folding his hands and say, when you're ready, I'll show up. No. He's your helper. Lord, right now, the way I feel right now, I'm not going to make a good decision. And I know that. And I know you're here to help me. So I'm going to speak your word and I'm going to pray in the spirit because I know not. I hope you know that verse. All right. Romans 8, 26. Romans 8, 26, please. For we know not what to pray for as we ought. Well, you know, juxtaposing that with James chapter one that says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask from God. But let him ask in faith. Nothing with him. All right. Nothing. Don't waver. Don't waver. Ask in faith. I, I don't want to waver, but God, I don't know how to pray about this thing right now. There are 10 options in front of me, 10 jobs, 10, 10, whatever, five, three, whatever. But I know you know, all right? In Psalm 32, verse 8, NLT, he said, I will lead you along the best pathway. So I know you know what it is. So I'm going to just pray and talk about it. So your mind, you say, but if I do that, won't my mind still be, you know, unstable? You know, mind is wavering. Your mind can now be fixed on, in the midst of all this wavery stuff going on around me, I'm enjoying God's best because I prayed about it and he's leading me. So your mind is on that one. Can we start from there? Can you start from there? My mind might be 
busy here, but I've prayed about it and the Holy Ghost is guiding me into the best. So your mind stays, you know, I learned from, you know, Reverend Keith Moore, start from what you know and, and talk more about what you know. Don't do, I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And then you keep magnifying what you don't know. What do you know? Yet you don't know what, which of the options to pick. Is this blessing somebody? He's helping somebody. You don't know which of the options to pick, but you know, because I've prayed in the spirit, I know he's guiding me because I've trust in the Lord on my heart. I know he's guiding me. Do you know that one? If your answer is yes, stay on that one. Do you understand that? If you know that one, stay on it. If you know that one, stay there. Whatever you know, stay on it. Just let it help you. Stop magnifying what you don't know. I don't know. I know you don't. He knows you don't. God, I'm confused. This guy and that guy and this other guy. And this is this, you know, his qualities. And my mom likes this one. And my daddy likes this other guy. And then my friends want this other guy. God, I'm confused. God is not confused. There's no confusion. I look forward to the next edition. We're going to talk about, because listen, the more you know who you are in, in the spirit and what your spirit has and is, the, you can renew your mind too, because if you say renew your mind, to what? So you need to know what you're in your mind too, all right? But let me say it while we're at it. There's no confusion in the realm of the spirit. There's no confusion in you. Nay, all right? It's, it's not gray. It's either black or white. It's clear in your spirit right there, all right? Clear. Your brain goes, I don't know who to pick. I don't know what to pick. He knows. And then go, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Maybe we'll do that for someone's sake right now. Maybe one, maybe two people, you know. There's, you, you have decisions. We could pray. It's word up. We could pray three minutes, four minutes. We could pray. All right, just pray in the spirit, all right? But before, hold on, hold on. You might want to open Romans 8, okay? So let's open to Romans chapter 8. Thank you, Lord. So in Romans chapter 8, the 26th verse of Romans chapter 8. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Just let's let's open it. I want you to read it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So Romans 8, 26. Okay, are we there? Likewise, the spirit also helps. And that's, he's excited when he helps us. He, he's here to help. Don't fear, man. God is also disappointing me. God is also disappointing me. He sent the spirit to help you. Stop magnifying God is also disappointing me. God wants me to be well. So he sent the spirit to help me. Likewise, the spirit also helps our infirmities for we know not what to pray for as we ought. You, you know what you want to pray for, but you don't know how exactly to pray about it, right? But the spirit himself makes intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Look at verse 27. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. So God has a will. God has a will. I know your mind might be busy, feeling confused, but could we pray in tongues a bit? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you because we have the helper. 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 Just pray in the spirit. For we know not what to pray for as we ought. We, we don't know how to go about it, but you do. You do. And you enlighten. Thank you, thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father, for enlightenment, enlightenment. Thank you for help. Thank you for help. Thank you, Father, for enlightenment. Thank you for help. 
Mompra tosu sofide ke borobo tu shofie. Ninia tosu kofede ke dolo kofoshi kofede ke borobo ti kofede ke dey. Naso sofede ke tesi kofede ke bosha. Nike apaka bara ka borobo shi sofie fede ke dolo kotu sososo. Nisa sososo. Nisa sososo. Nisa sososo. Sobi ke fede ke dey. Nike borobo tu rovie fede ke boro kotu shofie fede ke dey. Nike borobo shi shofie fede ke boro ti kete. Nike borobo shi shofie fede ke boro botai ka. Maho wa mahanaba. Eko boroba shisho biye bereke boroba shika boroba shika boroba shika bereke te. Thank you, Hallelujah. Thank you. Eno kopo shike bereke. Monka prota sateke mondo kuro bo shike bereke te. Thank you, Lord. You don't know what to pray for in your mind. It's okay. Let your spirit do the talking. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. When your spirit is done talking and while it's also talking, it will send a memo to your mind. Hallelujah. We'll deal with that soon enough. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. We'll still maybe do this a bit before we're done. Still stand. Sometime to do this. All right. Thank you, Lord. Because I don't talk about the place of prayer and revelation and all of that. Because it has to do with the mind. First Corinthians 14. All right. When you look at First Corinthians 14, I know you see a whole lot of praying tongues, praying tongues, praying tongues, and read a whole lot of praying tongues from it. But it's dealing a lot also with the mind. We are going to read First Corinthians 14 very soon because you can't just grow spiritually and then blow spiritually and you don't give attention to your mind. You, you don't. You know, you have to. You have to. And oh, nah. <laughs> let's let's hurry up on this. All right. So 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13, it says, wherefore, get up the loins of your mind, gird it up to gird like, you know, a girdle, all right, a girdle, you know, a clutch you tie around your waist. It says, get up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Get up. So that's what you do rather than, you know, when your mind is wavering, your mind is shaky, gird it up, gird it up, gird it up, gird it up. Now, while some are trying to gird up their minds, which we're all supposed to do, there's a bracket also called a corruption of the mind. I just, how many can I pick from this now? All right, 1 Timothy 6 and 5, 1 Timothy 6, 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such, withdraw yourself. Get away when people, and, and we make this mistake. Thank God for the teachings on prosperity that have greatly liberated the church, you know, the last many, many years. But you have to draw the line between prosperity and materialism. All right. I mean, it takes money to be on Zoom. It takes money to, our video is better today because there's an attached, you know, webcam here. And, you know, it, it, it's money. We have a guest tomorrow. We're giving an hour. And this is free. All right. We're, we're be totally free, but we you know, open to partnership and seeds and all of that. And then we'll give, I want to give a good arm and we'll, we'll keep having guests. We'll do many, many things. All right. So I'm able to have a brighter video because, you know, <laughs> it's funny. And then many things you do. So ministry itself, all right, requires, um, you know, funds, finances. It's, it's just money to be a blessing to people, to Jesus had partners in his ministry. So the issue of money is not wrong. So Paul is not saying, hey, no. But Paul, Paul is saying, do not think that gain is godliness. Don't think, oh, um, if you were really spiritual, then you have a lot of money and you missed that point. John the Baptist was one of the greatest men that ever lived, but he didn't have the money Abraham had or David had or Job had. He was the greatest. By assignment, by purpose, by obedience, by fulfillment, you know, by assignment, basically, you know, I mean, everybody obeyed God on whatever God called him to do. But his own assignment was to point out the Christ. And Jesus said, that's the greatest. That's, that's the greatest. But he wasn't the richest, but he was the greatest. Do you understand that? You know, now, yes, spirit, it should translate into all of that. But if you read Hebrews 11, there were those that the Bible said they didn't even want to be delivered because they wanted a better resurrection. So someone could even decide, I, I just want to be a bit conservative and fulfill God's assignment. And you just feel, no, no, if you're not rich, then you're not spiritual. Bible says, run away from such, all right? Because it could tend easily to materialism. Many believers, and if you... You know, take out and read, you know, first, please write this down. I need to read First Timothy 6, the whole of it, in about three or four different Bible translations. Did you get that? I'll say it again. Say to yourself, I need to read First Timothy chapter 6, the whole of it, in about three or four different Bible translations. Please do that. Do that soon. 
the whole of it. You will see the balance of prosperity. Paul says, be rich. It's just says, be careful with your money. Many in pursuing money have allowed many arrows to pierce through them. And many believers have been hurt, right? In just trying to get rich and trying to live large and live, you'll hurt yourself. But money is good. You should be rich and should be able to, you know, and then the money doesn't have you. And you know what to do with the money for kingdom's sake. Because whatever I have now, all it's in first Moses six, all right. The life that is the life that has come. You see all that in first Moses six now. Second Timothy 3 8. Now, as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Corrupt minds. So minds can be corrupt, all right. Titus 1 15. And we're going to read, uh, I would have wanted to read. Hmm, 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 hmm. Now, because of time, I won't do that anymore. You know Titus chapter 1, the, the whole of Titus chapter 1, 1 to 16. I was going to read the whole of it. But this is verse 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their minds and conscience is defiled. Unto the pure, things are pure. But there are those who, so someone could be a believer, but then allow his mind to be corrupt, his conscience to be defiled. You say, how? Because he keeps allowing negative things. You know, so if you've opened the door to negative things, shut the door. Shut the door. You know, when I watch these kinds of videos, it does, it tempts me this way. Sends, then, then cut away. Jesus said, if your eye or hand will cut you, you still pluck out the eye, cut off the hand. So yours means go away from it. Don't, don't create more temptations for yourself than even you can handle. Even God is checking the temptation that come to you, then you don't create more for yourself. It's, we get into trouble when we do that. So you don't need it. All right. See, see I, and I know you know this one, the next one after this, but it's still similar. Second Corinthians 3 and 14. But their minds were blinded. For until that, until this day, all right, remains the same veil on taking away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Also about, you know, reading of the law in first, second Corinthians chapter three. So there was a blinding of their minds. Second Corinthians 4, 4. In whom the God of this world, he says, for our gospel be hid, is he to them that are lost in verse three. Verse four. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, should shine. So th there's a blinding of the mind. He didn't say blinding of the spirit. He uses the word mind. All right. That's why, and I'm a bit ahead of myself. That's why the prayer in Ephesians 1 is that the eyes of their understanding be enlightened. It's not actually a spirit prayer. It's not, they are born again. So the problem is not that they should be born again, is the eyes of their understanding will be enlightened. Are you getting that? It's so that their, their minds will be flooded with revelation. Glory to God. I'm just going to spend a bit of time there soon, all right, together with the first thing that was 14 and everything. I've reserved that you know, like for the end part, okay? So we'll get there soon. So I'll say, let's go there now, soon, soon. I also want to get there quickly. All right, we're going to get there. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear less by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Did you get that? So the same way the serpent beguiled Eve, he said, I, I pray also, I'm afraid, I pray, all right? So that, you know, your own mind should not be corrupted. These are believers. So a believer could be corrupted in the mind. And the corruption here is not just corruption like sin, you know, smoking and all those kind of things you're going to come up with, you know, and then somebody gives you smoking and sin. That, I, Example, let's not enter theological debate. All right. But I mean, don't take something that'll kill you. All right. Just could take you out faster. And you know that. Now, so he, he's saying, you know, that it could be corrupt. And he's now said the simplicity of Christ. So sometimes this could just even be about moving to the law. You know, now just going under the burdens of the law. It, it's a corruption of the mind. When you understand the revelation knowledge and, and where you know, faith, living by faith as against living by the law is concerned. You understand that when you move from that level of faith to now wanting to live by law, the mind is being corrupted, all right? That's why Paul, you know, wrote in Galatians chapter 3, who bewitched you? Foolish, who, who bewitched you? All right, you wonder what were they? These guys, it wasn't about, you know, they were not shacking up. 
you know, they were not, you know, doing things we will call sin, but Paul was mad. Who bewitched you? How could you jump back from the law? I mean, from grace and then jump into the law. Who bewitched you? All right. So that, that was big on, on Paul's plate. That was big on Paul's plate. Let's, let's start tying this, you know, somehow, you know. In, in Romans chapter, and I know you know, maybe you've been waiting for it. I've made reference to it all through, but let's read it, all right? Romans 12, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So conform, transform, conform, transform, conform, transform. You, you see here, my mind has a lot to play. I could pray in tongues and my mind is shaking. I could ask you for something, but I'm double-minded. I could not be of one mind with a fellow believer. I could not be of same mind with Christ on a particular matter, like being humble about certain things. And I'm, I'm not really, I'm born again. If anything happens to me, now I'm going straight to heaven. I'm going straight to heaven. But my mind, my mind has a lot to do with this thing. So it says, don't conform to this world. You know, when, when you watch TV and then you see the fear going on and the corruption going on and all of that happening, all right, then you switch that off and switch on the word of God. You give attention to the word, attention to the word, attention to the word, all right? Ephesians 4.23 says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So there's, there's a spirit of your mind. And what's it it's still saying? Renew your mind. All right. It means in the core of your mind, in the very center, in the alertness of your mind. Be renewed in it. How? Through the word. You give attention to the word again and again, your mind will be renewed. Don't forget that. Your mind will be renewed. Now we're swinging and this will lead us to the very, uh, okay, last scripture. Which one was that? I, I just saw the comment. Someone could help me with that anyway. Uh, it depends on which which of the verses was the last. And how many minutes ago, I just, you know. Um, but let's see. I know there was Ephesians 4, 23, and then there was Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And before then, there was 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3 that says, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. If that is it, then it will be 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, all right? Okay, so the last, we have like a 30-minute stretch right now. Okay, still like four minutes before 30 minutes, but a 30-minute stretch, I'll use the last few minutes for announcement. I'm going to switch into that revelation knowledge aspect of the mind, okay? Well, let's build from here. Romans chapter 8, 5 to 7. Romans 8, 5 to 7. Um, please, the last we are. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, I think I got it. 2 Corinthians um, 5. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 11. All right. There, there you have it. So, Romans 8, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Romans 8, 5 to 7. Romans 8, 5, 7. For they that are after the flesh, watch this now. Do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to love, God, neither it can be. There's an argument here, but listen, we need to easily, all right, and simply understand the point of this. What your mind feeds on is what affects you. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. If you mind the things of the flesh, watch that. They that are after the flesh do mind things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit mind the things of the spirit. So where is your attention? What's your mind attached to? What's your mind hinged on? They that are after the flesh. It now says, verse 6, to be carnally minded is death. And we said all carnality is not sin, and all sin is not, I mean, all sin is carnality, all carnality is not sin, but to be fleshly minded is death. How? Because it opens up to things. This is not being just being a natural man, uh, I'm, I'm in the spirit, I'm not in the flesh. Hold on. Carnally minded. If you keep giving attention to carnality, it produces some level of death, whether depression, whether sickness, whether a number of these things that eventually become the offshoot of it. I mean, Paul wrote again to the Galatian church and he said, do not be deceived, right? God is not mocked. Whatever a man who sow is that which we reap. And that those that sow to the flesh 
will from the flesh reap corruption. Those that sow to the spirit will from the spirit reap everlasting life. I was talking to the church. All right. He was saying, be careful what you feed on. Be careful where you put your mind. Be careful what you give attention to. Those that sow to the flesh would of that same flesh reap corruption. Those that sow to the spirit will from the same spirit reap life everlasting. So it says something similar here. To be carnally minded is death. Those that sow to the flesh will reap corruption. Carnally minded is death. Spiritually minded is life and peace. Those that sow to the spirit will reap life everlasting. So if you put this together with Galatians you know, 6, you see the same thing going on. That the mind, I have the life of Christ in my spirit. But if I want to enjoy the life of Christ in my mind, in my body, in my environment, I've got to give my attention to spiritual things. I've got to put my mind more on spiritual things. I've got to give my mind to it. I have to allow myself to yield my, my thinking, my thought pattern to spiritual things. I, I can't just be free in my mind and say, well, I'm born again. No. All right. Prayer and fasting cannot take the place of the renewal of the mind. All right. I repeat that. Prayer and fasting cannot take the place of the renewal of the. It, it, can, it can't take that place. No, no, it can't. It can't. So you say, oh, um, I want to be more spiritual. I just want to pray and fast. I mean, Kenny Hagen told, you know, the folk that they were together in the Voice of Healing Movement. He said, you guys are building your ministries on, on sensationalism, on gifts. I'm building my ministry on the word. Many years after you're all gone, I'll still be standing. And that is way more than evident right now. Because the word is stability. You, you don't build your mind on, I mean, one of, if you've read God's realms for one of the stories that, you know, still touch me, even the thought of it is about Evan Roberts. You know, how that, you know, his mind was affected. You know, that a woman had to take advantage of all of that, locked him up somewhere. You know, go read the story yourself. He just... He just touches the heart. And then he's, you know, emotional, moved by, oh, some people didn't get blessed. And so, you know, you, you just get, and you really need to be careful with emotionalism in ministry. You know, it, whether it's about walking up on people's emotions or you being very emotional about it, you know. And if you read from these great, you know, generals we get to follow, they've been at some points where they feel, oh God, but everybody didn't get healed. Every, you know, and then they had to learn, play your part. Do your own part. Do your part, teach them healing, lay hands on them, do all the things. But you can't go home with that emotion of, no, that emotion, compassion, you know, the compassion of the Lord is not, is it, you could come at it from an emotional point of view, but it's more of a spirit, but yes, translates a lot into your emotion, could even impact upon your body. But it's not just pity, it's not, oh, 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 pity, no, it's beyond that. Is beyond that. So if you want to grow spiritually, put your mind on spiritual things. All right. And guard the thoughts that go against those spiritual things. Guard it. If you want to do a general study on this on your own, check for words after they understand. Understanding. All right. Understand. Understanding. Thoughts, imagination, mind. All these talk about the faculty of a soul. And then you read a lot about it and realize, oh, this has a major role to play in my spiritual growth and development. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, all right? I reasoned as a child, I spoke as a child. So you find that it was largely about his thinking pattern. He matured in revelation and revelation is not complete without it affecting your understanding. I might need to say that again. Revelation is not complete if it doesn't affect your understanding. That's why you're reading Bible and go, I see it now. What happened? The eyes of your understanding was enlightened. Your mind was influenced with light. Did you get that? Your spirit had the light, but something just blew up in you like, I see it now. I get it now. I understand it now. Woo! It, it... So to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. When you wonder, oh, I think I'm drowning a lot more in carnality. Shut the door and begin to you know, it is like when someone is rushed to the hospital and they have to run like drips through the person, they need to flush out a whole lot of ugly stuff. So you might need to do that flushing. But this is it. It's not even in the number of tapes you are listening to. How well is your mind grabbing what you're listening to? I'll tell you this one. I've shared it before a few times. You know, a number of years ago, you know, I had this feverish feeling all over my body. And then there's this Ken Hagen healing scriptures, right? That 
you know, I had, and then I, I was playing it. I think it was cassette tape back then. So I was playing in Healing Scriptures by Kenneth E. again. And then <laughs> I was sinking deeply into the chair. I was playing the word. And then like, you know, just not feeling too well. Like, just let your body go. Just let it lie down. Let it just, just let it thing. Just let it, let the sickness run through. Just fall ill for a while, but just be, you know, listening. And the Holy Ghost said to me, quit that or else the sickness will find greater expression. And he began to say, as you hear the verse, quote the verse. Hear the verse, quote the verse. So can I again quote, say, says it, I quote it. Says it, I quote it. So he says, I quote it. See, I realized that the more I kept doing that, something began to happen to me. And I started adjusting. I sat up. You know, it took some minutes though, but I kept adjusting, kept adjusting, kept adjusting, kept adjusting. If not, I'd just been, you know, after a while lying down and the, the word is playing potent enough to impact upon me right there, but eventually it would have very little impact because I am not allowing it to do what it should do. So it's plain, all right? And you say, my spirit is hearing it. I know, but your mind needs to hear it and your mind needs to grab it. Did you hear that? You know, I, I know, I know, and I've done a lot of that. My spirit is hearing it. And over time, you just realize you're quoting things. You didn't even know when you ever read them or heard them. You just know why? Because your spirit stored up a lot of these things. Your spirit can pick these things even when you're not conscious. I know. But for it to be usable immediately, like now, your, the eyes of your understanding needs to boom. Did you get that? Boom. That's why you're meditating on the verse. Meditating on the verse, meditating on the verse. And suddenly it comes alive. It comes alive. Something happened to your understanding. It shifts it. You experience what Romans refers to as that transformation. 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 All right, praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So set your mind on spiritual things. I beg you. Set your mind on spiritual things. Set your mind on spiritual things. If you easily get depressed, you easily get worked up, Tell yourself, if I keep allowing this happen to me, I'll be a prayer giant, as it were, but I'll be an emotional, uh, a, a, an emotionally unstable prayer giant. You'll be a word quota, a choir, you know, a member, something, but you'll be emotionally unstable because you're allowing those things. Don't forget, in Isaiah said, he will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him. You have to put your mind on him. There's a storm all around you, but you say, no, I'm going to keep my mind here. All right? Academic storm, financial storm, marital storm, economic storm. He said, I'm going to put my mind here. He will keep in perfect peace. Whose mind? So your spirit is together. Your spirit is in union with him. But your mind, Paul, in writing to the Philippians, all right, is told them the things to think on. It has to be good, lovely, good report. I mean, virtue, praise. Think on, on these things. Think, be anxious for nothing. All those have to do with your soul. Your spirit has no anxiety. But your soul can be shaken. We saw that earlier. Your soul can shake. You say, no, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. My, my, I, you know, you just know in, in the name of Jesus. All right, let, let me say this while, while I'm at it. Um, okay. Um, you, all right, thank you. Yeah, let, let me say this while I'm at it. The, the Andrew Mark video, I would um, do a better test run when we're done. So we could play it tomorrow once we start, you know, and then Kylie comes up. I think that's fine if, if that's okay with you. So that I just run through and then we're, we're almost done already. I'm mindful of it, but I won't want to read that comment and then come back and uh, check, check, check a few minutes. But tomorrow we start out, I do a bit of intro, you know, maybe running through and then she fires up because I really would love us to watch that video. So tomorrow... Once it's time, just let's all log in and then we fire on. But tomorrow will be awesome, all right? I, I believe today has been helpful too. So, dear Lord, thank you, Lord. Because, you know, over time people say, oh, I'm, I'm spiritual. I, but I wonder why I'm, you know, I get depressed. If you keep allowing that, it's it's carnality. Listen, it's, it's you yielding more to the impulses of the flesh. All right. I know it might sound uh, maybe insulting to someone or insultive or... Um, insensitive to someone, you know, saying, oh, your depression is, you know, canality. I understand that. But what I'm letting you understand is this, please. No, no, of course, you know, no insult or anything intended. All right, please. Uh, but what I need you to understand is if we feast our attention on things, they will depress us. 
Jesus was clear about it. In this world, you will have tribulation. It will come. We will be depressed. There's enough to depress us all around. There's enough to even think, oh my goodness, the devil has conquered the whole world. This generation Z and everybody, they've gone with Satan. But it's not true. Elijah felt that way. I'm the only one, God. I'm the only one. God said, guy, I got 7,000 people who've never bowed the knees to bow. You know, to bow. So you, you might see, oh, this next generation, they're just gone with the devil. No, they are not. A mighty army is arising. A mighty army is arising. God didn't give his only begotten and then to lose at the end of it all. A mighty army is arising. The church is triumphant. The church of Jesus Christ is highly triumphant. Do you understand that, please? All right. So let's, let's, so if you keep putting your mind there, they will weaken you. But let's, let's roll down. Thank you there, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul in Ephesians 1, which you already know, says that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we may know and begin at least three major things, the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance and the saints, and the exceeding greatness of his power. These three things I just said like this. <laughs> These three things, hope of his calling, which is going to say at times the saints, exceeding greatness of the part of us all who believe are going to walk in the right part of the I mean, you know, the way we used to speak and speed pray. You can speed pray that prayer. Like, you all run through all the polite prayers, you know, and then move from Ephesians, you know, one to three to Philippians to Colossians, and then just speed pray. Calm down. <laughs> The three points in Ephesians 1, I believe till today, the church is yet to grasp them. And I've heard Ken again talk about these things. And I say that the church is still at the infancy of these revelations. And I pray that in our own time, we'll be able to walk in it a lot more. And, and, and we should just you know, to ward off, you know, things that might want to pull us here and there. But, you know, the exceeding greatness of his power to us what I believe, according to the workings of his mighty power. I mean... Resurrection powers are working you and I, guys. That that's what that last point is saying. But not 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 today. Not today. Not at all today. No. But it's deep. But he began with the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So we'll go to First Corinthians chapter two, and then we'll go to First Corinthians fourteen. Like I said, when we talk about praying in tongues, what we're dealing with is really understanding. All right. First Corinthians chapter two, verse. Um, we'll just pick it quickly from verse 9. All right. I has not seen, nor hear, heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the thing that God has prepared for them that love him. Verse 10. But God hath revealed these things to us. How? By his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. The spirit knows the depths of God. The spirit knows everything in the mind of God. The spirit knows everything, 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 everything about God. You know that. I know you know mentally, but from the verse, all right? Verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man, except the spirit of man that is in him, even so the things of God knows nobody but the spirit of God. So if God thinks a thought now, who knows it? Spirit of God. Now, spirit of God. Now, spirit of God. Now, now, now. You know, now, three seconds ago, is not now again. <laughs> Whatever the now is, the spirit of God knows every single thing on the mind of God. Did you get that? The spirit of God knows everything on God's mind. He does. He knows everything. All right. So no man knows things of a man except the spirit of man that is in him. Even so the things of God knows somebody by the spirit of God. Verse 12, I love verse 12, I love verse 12. Now we have received, not will, not might. Now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is from God so that we may know the things freely. I love this one. This goes to confirm that God gives you his spirit to help you. Stop trying to impress God. I have faith. I want to show God I have faith. I want to show God. No, no, no. He gave you help. <laughs> you know, the other extreme is someone says, well, God knows I don't have faith and God understands that way. If you can't meet my need, he just knows I'm okay. No, that's another extreme. You don't impress him and you don't take advantage of knowing that he wants to help you. I mean, you don't abuse it, rather. You take advantage of it, you know, with every biblical honor. I have a helper. I have a helper. So you help. And part of how you help, you give you instruction. You give you, you know, all of that, you know. So I have received, not the spirit of this world, but I have received the spirit that is from God, 
that I may know things. Hi, the Holy Ghost is in charge of that revelation department. How? Don't forget. Verse 10, first of all, God reveals things to us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, even a deep thing. God reveals by his spirit. So the spirit is in that revelation. He's handling that reveal. reveal. God reveals things to me by his spirit. He reveals things to you, 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 you. Yes, God reveals things to you by his own spirit. All right? Because the 11, nobody knows anything in the mind of God except the spirit of God. So how does God make the things in his mind known to us? Through his spirit. So you see verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God that we may know. Say with me, I have the Holy Ghost so that I may know things. I have the Holy Ghost so that I may know things. I have the Holy Ghost so that I may know things. I have the Holy Ghost so that I may know things. The Father wants me to know things. So he gave me his spirit. Did you get that? The Father wants me to know things. So he gave me his spirit. The Father doesn't want me ignorant. The Father doesn't want me in the dark. The Father wants me to know things. So he gave me his spirit. This is very clear. And, you know, just together with John 16, 13. Jesus in John 16, 13 says when, John 16, 13 says, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself. Whatever he hears, he will speak and he will show you things to come. It's the same spirit, it's the same spirit, all right? Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but a spirit that is from God that we may know. I have a spirit so that I may know. I have a spirit so that I may know I'm not born to be in the dark. I'm not meant to be in the dark. I'm a child of light. I have a spirit so that I may know. I have a spirit so that I may know. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 13 says, you know, which things also we speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but in words which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 14, but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. 15, he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. 16 now says, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. 16 again, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Did you get that? Who's known his mind to instruct him? How did you get the mind of Christ? You have to go to 11. Nobody knows the thoughts of God except Spirit of God in him. Nobody knows thoughts of God. Only Spirit of God knows thoughts of God. So how did I get the mind of Christ? Because I have the person that has the mind of Christ living in me, so I have the mind of Christ. All right. So I'm going to 14, chapter 14 right now. When we get chapter 14, I want you to see something. Your spirit is the one that knows your thoughts. You see that here, verse 11. No man knows thoughts of man except realizing. All right. All right. So even so he thinks of God knows more the spirit of God. So the spirit of God knows the thoughts of God. And first Corinthians 14, 14 amplifies says, When I pray in tongues, my spirit by the Holy Spirit in me is praying. Did you get that? First Corinthians 14, 14 amplified. When I pray in tongues, my spirit by the Holy Spirit in me prays. Meaning the person who knows my thoughts is praying to God with the help of the person who knows the thoughts of God. Woof! My spirit is praying, talking to God. And then your mind goes, I don't understand. Stop that language. Say something I know. Say, mind, we will send you the memo when we're done. Because we need you in this process. Why? When there's now an interpretation, or a revelation, none of these become usable until the mind can access it, you know, interpret effectively and take action. Say so print tongues. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Oh, I made a way for you. So it comes in a language you understand. Because your mind is needed. Did you get that? Your mind, how do you how do you prophesy? And prophecy is for edification, exhortation, and for comfort. First thing that's 14, right? How, how do you prophesy? for edification, exhortation, and for comfort First thing I was 14, right? How, how do you prophesy, all right? So prophecy, don't forget, edification. Nobody can be edified if they don't understand what you said. So 1 Corinthians 14 is all about, allow me just say it that way. It's all about understanding. You find Paul saying, I would rather speak five words, all right, in my known language than, you know, I blast around a thousand words in tongues so that the hearer can, why? He's saying they need to get the point I'm making. 
Let, let, let me pick it from okay. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. 14, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? Watch this. I'll pray, and we use this for ourselves. We just brag. What is it? I'll pray in the spirit. I'll pray with the understanding also. I'll sing with the spirit. And then you pray, right? Yes, pray in the spirit and sing in the spirit. Yeah, but it's not about you. This is not your personal devotion. Paul wasn't, 1 Corinthians 14 has very little to do with personal devotion. Stay with me, please. Let's just run through from verse one. Follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. Fortune as 14 has very little to do with personal devotion. I know we brought a lot of verses out of it to talk about talking in tongues. It has very little to do with personal prayer. All right. Larry, speed up. Thank you. Good. So follow after charity, desire spiritual gifts, but rather desire all them gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh not unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. No man understands, but in spirit is speaking mysteries. you get me? I know you're speaking mysteries. Keep speaking mysteries. Keep, keep doing that. But so verse three counters, as it were, verse two, because verse three is continuing. Verse one, I want you to prophesy. So I, he said, when you talk in tongues, you're speaking between yourself and to God. But he that prophesies speaks to men unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. So with all your spirituality and big revelations and everything happening to you, I need to be able to be a blessing to people. That's what this chapter is basically about. Be a blessing to people. Speak in usable, understandable language so that they can go and act it out. That's what the chapter is about. Don't forget, verse 3 begins with but he who prophesies, it compares. You're talking to yourself, you're good, but he who prophesies speaks to men on edification, exhortation, and comfort. Verse 4, he that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but again, he that speaks, he that prophesies edifies the church. So he's making a comparison when you're talking tongues, kudos, great job, keep it up. But the guy who prophesies again, the lady who prophesies is all right, and the tongue he's speaking here really is not even tongues for private devotion, it's tongues in a public space. That's what he's dealing with here in context. All right, he that speaks in a known tongue, verse 4, he that speaks in a known tongue, he finds himself, but he that prophesies, he finds the church. I would rather that you all speak with tongues, not tongues, general everyday tongues. It's going somewhere. I would rather that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesy. I'll prefer better than you speaking with the gift of tongues, when he mentioned in chapter 12, I'd rather you speak that tongue, not the everyday tongue, but rather that you prophesy, for greater is he that prophesies, all right, than he that speaks with tongues, except interpret that the church may receive a divine. So it's about the people. So this tongue is not your personal tongue. So he that speaks in tongue, I defy himself, I defy myself, I defy myself, and it's fantastic. We've learned a lot, and there's still so much to learn from that. We build up ourselves, we charge ourselves like battery, but he's also in more context dealing with whoever speaks in tongue in public. You're not so useful to the church if they don't get what you're saying. So what he's teaching here is about understanding. The guys have to get it to grow. So, you know, we, we brag about, oh, you know, that person flows in tongues and interpretation. If I don't flow in tongues and interpretation, all I do is flow in prophecy. I'm good. I'm, I'm great. I'm great. <laughs> Context. You know, uh, verse six. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophecy or by doctrine, usable, understandable language. Verse seven. And even things without life give sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sound. How shall it be known what is piped or harp? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, how shall, you know, who shall prepare himself for battle? So likewise you, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. I'm reading King James in case you're wondering what I'm reading, all right? Verse 9, so likewise you, except you utter by the tongue, words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. Konoboshinta, komdeboshinte. Great, if it's private devotion, but you're in church, but your voice is loud, which you all do when we're praying together, it's fantastic. All right, fine. All right, right. But he's saying, don't operate the gift of tongue or message in tongue, and you hang everybody there. Verse 10. 
for there it may be, right? So many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification, right? Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall, he, I shall be to him that speak a barbarian and he that speaks shall be a barbarian also unto me, even so you. For as much as you're zealous about spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of a church. Guys, I, I'm sure maybe someone is watching and like, maybe you're seeing this for the first time. This, the context of 1 Corinthians 14 is about being a blessing to people. He mentioned gifts and administration and operations in chapter 12, brought in love, which is was a more excellent way by chapter 13. Then he expands that love dimension in chapter 14. This gift that you have, use it to be a blessing to people. Let them be able to operate in usable, understandable language. So at the end of the day, this is about the mind. Because if all come and blast tongues, it's spirit and understands tongue. It has to come in a language the mind can use for proper action. Larry, keep moving. We're almost done anyway. Have you been blessed? <laughs> all right. You know, da -da 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 -da. What, what, what verse was that? You know, yeah, verse 12. Even so, you, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speak in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So it's not that the tongue here is not your private tongue. It's tongue like to minister. Nobody needs interpretation for your private <laughs> what do they need the interpretation of your own private conversation with God for? All right, none of their business. All right, 14 for if I pray and I don't tongue, my spirit prays, my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I'll pray with the spirit, I'll pray with the understanding. Also, I will sing with the spirit, I'll sing with the to be able. It's still context of blessing. I know it's tongues interpretation, yes, but in the context of be a blessing. All right, verse 16. Else, when you shall bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing that he understands on what you say? For you verily give thanks well. Verse 17. You did a great job. He that speak, you know, give thanks in spirit. And we use that verse. He said, but you give thanks well, but the other person is not edified. I thank my God. I speak in tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I may teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in your understanding. It means I want you to get this point. However, in malice, be children because you had said they were you're having division amongst them. In all sense, be children, be immature about those things. But in understanding, be men. So I'll, I'll pause there, all right? I, I think that's fine because if I enter further on no but, but we're good we're good i'll use all those other ones i'll talk a lot more about gifts of the spirit flowing in the holy ghost and all of that because we need to look at what the context really 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 is all of ministry at the end of the day is to provide usable usable information the mind the mind so even when you pray in tongues a whole lot yeah I, i'm using king james all right so even when you pray in tongues a whole lot but you could you could use whichever is available. New King James is easier. It still stays with the original King James, but it's just the D and thou and all. It's it's off it. All right. Usable language that will bless you. So why would it bless you? Because your mind got it. So it happens also to you. So you're praying tongues about things you want to do. Praying tongues, please, as, as we close right now. Just praying tongues. We have two minutes, two minutes here, three minutes here. All right, just pray in tongues, you know. Thank you, Lord. Go read to God. So as you do that, do that more, you know. It says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has he entered into the heart of man, the thing that God has prepared for them that love him, you know, but God reveals. So when I quote about she get I engage the revealer. So what happens to me? I enjoy the reverse of that 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 2, 9. It says, excuse me, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, he hasn't entered into the heart of man. So what begins to happen to me is my eyes begin to see, my ears begin to hear, my heart begins to conceive the things that God has in store for me. You understand? So I, I talk in the kaposhike maybe by temperament and phlegmatic i just lose opportunities i'm too choleric and run around and do or i'm too whatever melancholy depressed you know all the extremes of all the they have good sides but all the extremes of their bad sides when i pray in tongues they help they help i enjoy help thank you father i enjoy help i enjoy help i enjoy help i enjoy edification i'm built up I'm built up. He gives me instructions. He gives me guidance. He, he gives me strength. I'm built up. Glory to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Glory to Jesus. 
pia prodoko dososo fiende krodondo kusuto bie kadoso friendo this this is just you know you edifying yourself thank you father thank you father we may know not what to pray for as we ought but we thank you because we're not helpless we have your spirit to teach and to guide us to teach to lead and to guide us carry akada carry akada we move we're guided into victory victory into victory victory upon 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 victory we refuse to have our minds to waver we refuse to have our minds shaken we refuse to have our minds shaken oh but we gird up the loins of our minds we gird it up we're firming up, putting our faith in you. We set our minds on you and on your word that you have given to us a helper. Oh, I have a helper in the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you there, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. When you pray in tongues like that, the memo is sent to your mind. Your mind will question. I don't understand the language. Over time, your mind begins to relax and say, I'll get the memo. <laughs> I'll get the memo. All right. When my spirit and then the spirit of God, when they're done talking or while they're talking, I'll see flashes. I'll see, you know, like with my mind's eye, I'll catch an idea. I'll see flashes. I'll see something rising up, direction, clarity coming up. I'll see it. I'll see it. Glory to God. And it comes and it rises up within me. Glory to God. And it comes and it rises up. The mind will get the memo. Don't forget that. Your mind is needed in this transaction. Your mind is needed in this whole transaction. Praise God. All right. Um, um, one minute past here, yeah, exactly one minute, uh, exactly time here. We got to end. Praise God. Glory to God. Glory to God. But you, you don't have to. You don't have to end. We just, it's two hours, so we end right now. You could still print on a little bit or much later in the night. And it's um, Saturday. So, you know, whatever else you have to do, whatever time zone you might be in right now, just maybe take a little more. But always remind yourself, my mind gets the memo. <laughs> it's a union. All right. It's a union. Revelation is not complete if my mind doesn't get it. So the eyes of my understanding, my mind, we flooded with light. I will know what to do. My eyes are seeing, my ears are hearing, and my heart conceives. Thank you so very much. Please be on time tomorrow. The whole video thing, I'll sorry that. I'm learning. I have been learning. I have been learning so much All right, in the last few weeks about Zoom, and I'm getting better at it, and I'm loving it. I love what I'm learning. I'm getting better at it, and I believe that you see more of our improvements over time, and you know, with the team that God has blessed me with, you know, we'll keep learning, we're improving and we're getting better, you know, with all the things that we do. And um, yeah, so we will be here tomorrow. Please be on time. Um, you, you can still invite people, let them jump in. They will be like so much blessed tomorrow. Like I said, I'll do a quick intro, watch the Andrew Womack video. And then Kylie comes up and just takes us on. Praise God. Yeah, thank you for tuning in. Thank you so very much, everybody. And have a very wonderful wonderful afternoon evening night midnight or wherever uh whatever time time zone you're in all right praise god amen amen um so the link the link um okay let me let me i i can get the link here all right let me copy let me copy copy okay that's yeah copy well copy all right, copy. Yeah, I mean, so you don't have to wait for tomorrow in case you want to watch, paste, and um, all right. All right, so that, there it is. Um, um, let me know if you saw it. I just put it on the chat. Um, okay, to all, um, or, oh, okay, no. It just I just sent to panelists. All right, paste and um, yeah, there you go. You you could see the link right now. So yeah, if you want to watch the Andrew Walmart um, video today, um, right now, just enjoy it. Get blessed. Well, we could still play in class. I don't always call it class. You don't feel you know, but still class. All right. So there the link is. You could copy quickly. Um, I could just give a minute and then I time it out. All right. So you know, once again, you're you're welcome. Um, how can we get tonight's recording? Mm -hmm. uh, give us till Monday, please. I think all recordings will be available on Monday. Please give us till Monday. It will be on YouTube by Monday. Please give us till Monday. An email will be sent to you on Monday and then you'll get the link, all right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Um, have a beautiful night, all right? Yeah, bye, 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 bye. Thank you. <laughs>